1962, Kenny's father died under strange circumstances. He drank a mixture of turpentine and paraffin or something and got it mixed up with um, cough linctus or something and uh, poisoned himself, actually, and I think he died the next day in hospital. Kenneth says in the diaries it's a mystery how this stuff got, um, got in the bottle. Um, I have heard conspiracy theorists who thought Kenneth put it there, but, uh, you know, absolutely no evidence for that. But there doesn't seem to be much sadness when his father went. I mean, Kenneth was working in a play at the time, and he went on as usual that night, and uh, the night of his father's death, and uh, records the audience reaction. Charles died at three o'clock today, so it's all over. The doctor told Louis his brain was damaged. The show went okay, audience good, supper with Mags and Bev. He kept saying, Charles did, take these knives out of my stomach. For his entire life, Kenneth Williams lived alone and never had a partner. He perceived his parents as, as, as not a team, so there was no model there, I suppose, for him ever to emulate. But I think chiefly his problem with partnerships was the, was the matter of physical intimacy. I think the line that he took was, you know, because I asked him, uh, are, are you gay? And his reply was, um, you know, uh, mentally yes, uh, spiritually yes, physically no. After the death of his father, Kenneth bought his mother a flat near Regent's Park. And a few years later, he moved in next door. Uh, they were a bit like a sort of old married couple really. I mean, he, was, he was almost like his own father um, with his father. And then it was that kind of domesticity, bickering domesticity that they share. One of their neighbours was Paul Richardson, who became a close friend. Louis, myself and Ken would play Scrabble in Louis's flat. And of course, Ken used to take control of it, you know. I mean, they were bantered together and it was extraordinary. He'd say, oh, I've just won that uh, Scrabble game because I'm a star. And Louis would say, oh, bugger off. You're not in my home, you're not. You know, this sort of thing. And, and, and he would tell me, I said, well, this is a disgrace. How dare you talk to a star like that? And she said, oh, go away. Go to your own flat. So there's that sort of banter. No, no, Barbara. Tent up first. Bunk up later. In 1958, Kenneth began to act in the hugely successful series of Carry On films, well known for their bawdy humour and double entendre. It seems a little bit rickety, Doctor. Is it? Yes, but of course it's fairly easy to get it up. It's getting it to stay up. That's what counts. I think Kenny loved not only the financial security of the carry-ons, but the feeling of being with a family. And they were like a big family. I mean, it was usually the same people in most of the films. And of course he fitted into that team wonderfully. Now really, let's see those chests come out. And fling. The Camion series produced and some of the most fling. famous moments in British comedy. Matron, <laughs> 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 take them away. <laughs> of course, he was the licensed bad behaviour man on the set. He would do his naughty mimes while other people were trying to do their takes and so on, put them off. Because he'd done anything, mooning, anything. And, and uh, the others, of course, had seen it all before. I joined a bit later. And <laughs> it was a bit of a shock. Scriptwriters and producers had their little revenges on him, I think, because they'd always uh, build in these slapstick portions. They hated slapstick, hated anything to do with gunge and slop and falling into ditches and so on, but they always seemed to manage to arrange for him to go through some experience of that kind. It was in this very big scene when we were all around the table at the wedding scene and it was all, of course, real food and real trifles and Kenneth, at this particular moment, had to face in it. And every minute it got to it and we didn't, we didn't, for a whole day. And we had to go back the next day to pick it up and nobody could remove the trifle or any of this stuff because of the continuity. So overnight, in the heat of the studio, the cream had gone off it was quite terrible. I, I mean, oh. How dare you, old bag! Suddenly, my moment of triumph, and it won't. <laughs> and uh, this trifle was everywhere. Off trifle, and green cakes, and heaven knows what. Oh, it was I don't know how long it took me to clear that studio up. <laughs> What am I 
done to deserve all this? Have I displeased the gods in some manner? Oh, dark, invidious muse that blights my life. Come show your fearful haggish face. Yes. His starring roles in the Carry On films and his radio and theatre work made Kenneth a great British celebrity. But he wasn't always sure how to deal with his fame. He hate to be recognised most of the time. But sometimes when he felt he should be recognised, he wanted to be. Um, so he needed the recognition, but not the attention in some peculiar way. And of course, you can't have that. It doesn't work like that. One of his fans travelled from Hull to see Kenneth in a play and was determined to meet him. He came out to the theatre and I said, oh, could I have your autograph, please? So he signed it for me and then he said, oh, where are you from, you see? So I said, oh, Hull. Oh, he said, uh, do you work in the gutting sheds, you see, which is quite insulting because it's quite rough in there. So I said, I don't. So I said, I've never even seen one. I said, let alone been in one, you see. And he said, you come from Hull? And he said, you've never seen a gutting shed? I said, not just a fishing village, you know. And then afterwards I thought, when, when I was walking across from his sister, I said, do you know, I could have killed that. I said, I've waited for years to meet him. And that's, but anyway, afterwards, it's straight away after I'd said that, he said, uh, oh, he said, well, if you're down this way again, he said, just drop a note in the theatre and come round for drinks. That night began a friendship which lasted 17 years. They met frequently, and Kenneth wrote Barbara over 120 letters. Dear Barbara, I thought, oh, what a loyal chum when I got your letter. One that never lets you down, because your comments gave me a lift. Had to laugh at your reply. Your old chum, Kenneth. But Kenneth was having problems sustaining his serious acting career in the theatre. When I went to see him in private, Iron Public Ear, I went just after the opening night, and he gave a wonderful performance, so moving, so right on. And I went back three months later to see it, and... He'd just lost it. He'd, he'd suddenly gone for the easy way out. He was, like, playing for the laughs. He was doing the funny voices. And that was the problem for Kenneth. He starred in the first production of the play Loot, which was a flop. He then took a part in My Fat Friend, but dropped out due to ill health, causing the run to end early. He would turn things down and say, oh, it's rubbish. I don't want to be... The truth was, I think, that he'd lost his nerve to an extent. He didn't want to take the risk of failure. So the carry-ons became a more and more important part of his life. And, and sadly, you know, as far as the general public were concerned, he was just known for being that character on screen. Over the years, Kenneth made 26 carry-on films, but by the time he made carry-on Emmanuel in 1978, the routine was becoming tired. You can have Tom, Dick or Harry. I don't want Tom or Harry. I think he, he found at the end of the carry-on scripts were, his words, rubbish. But then I asked him the same question. I said, why do you do them? He said, pays the rent, mate. I've got my mother to look after, which is fair comments, you know. 